You just take the time to do things the right way. Magic happens. The universe rewards delayed gratification. If I could change any one thing on the internet that would dramatically transform the, the, the statistical outcomes of success online, it would be to switch the mindset from immediate gratification to delayed gratification. In fact, if anything, you should be looking to delay gratification even longer. This is The Fighting Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to entrepreneurs looking to change the world. Learn how to start, build, and scale a business in today's highly competitive business environment. Here's your host, The Fighting Entrepreneur, Anik Singhal. What's up, you crazy fighting entrepreneurs? Guess who it is? Your favorite person in the whole wide world, Onyx Singhal, back with a very power up, powerful episode today. It's one where I'm actually very excited because I have a lot of questions for this individual. Um, so you're probably going to find me very engaged and interrupting and asking questions. Just be prepared for it. All right. The episode today is how he built a hundred million dollar business on a twenty thousand dollar budget. Um, that is pretty damn impressive. I think that when it comes to return on investment, that's like a very high return on investment. Um, and I was just speaking to him and he said, you know, they're about to have they're, they're, for, uh, they're about to have a six million dollar month. Uh, it's nuts in less than three years or less than a year and a half. I don't even know. It was like less than a couple of years. All right. We are going to get into all of it. And he did all of this, by the way, the bulk of this growth has happened while everyone else is out there complaining about the pandemic. So we, we things, great things can happen during this time. If you apply, we're going to break it down as much as we humanly can. And then I'll direct you in his direction to learn even more from him. Um, and so a lot amazing stuff coming up there. But before we go into that, two things, one onicpodcast.com. We do have a brand new website. Have you checked it out? anikpodcast.com. You can search it. There's episodes are categorized. We're still working on it. It'll take some time to get it to be amazing, but it's it's definitely getting better for you to be able to absorb more and more of our episodes. All right. Number two, learn.com. L-U-R-N.com. Are you a member or not? We're approaching a half a million members. You want to help change the world? We got to do it together. We got to do it in community. This is your opportunity. Get in there right now. L-U-R-N.com. All right. Get into the community ASAP. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce to you a very dear friend of mine now. We've become closer and closer since we last met. So it's like an organic relationship. We've known of each other for years. Um, but then about a year, a little over a year ago, I met him, I believe, for the first time, uh, where we shook hands and we're in front of one another. He was actually here at the Learn Center. And um, we were running this event where we had seven, eight figure marketers here. Um, and we, we didn't get to connect at a deep level, but we, you know, it was a bit deeper than, Hey, hi, hello on Facebook messenger. And months went by, everyone's busy in their lives. Everyone's dealing with pandemic and everything. And months and months later we reconnect. And next thing I know, I just felt like we had warped in time or something because he had gone from having a good business to a booming, ridiculous rocket ship. So of course I was like, what the heck's going on? Like, I want to know more about this. And this is what I love about masterminding and love what, what I love about what we're doing at Learn, by the way, where we bring entrepreneurs together is because he looks at me and he's like, I really want to learn more about this one thing you're doing. And I'm like, forget that one thing. I want to learn more about that one thing you're doing or that three things you're doing. So we had areas where we could really support each other. And that led to at the end of that, you know, we actually ran a cross company mastermind. Um, so this is different than most people would ever do. We actually put our best of the best minds on a call and we said, hey, it's open season, share everything we're doing. I've never done that before with another company and it was awesome. It was so refreshing to know that nothing was off the table. Um, and then you know how I run my podcast. I pretty much do the same thing. He agreed to come on. I'm very excited to have him on. On Jeff Lerner, thank you so much for being here, my friend, and congratulations on your massive, ridiculous, holy crap success. That's all. That's the best way I can explain it. I mean, I'm grateful, grateful in so many ways for so much of what you said and so much of what's behind it. Um, you know, it's, it's, I keep pinching myself. It's like, you know, there've been some guys lately that I've really connected with and gotten close with and been on shows with, you know, folks like yourself and I'll use, you know, like, um, like Mike Dillard, for an example, you, you, you guys are guys that when I was getting started, I was like on your list and just thinking, man, I'd, I hope I can be as cool as those guys someday. And I've had to create my own version of cool. I'll never be as cool as you guys, but it's so cool. It is to, to get to connect as, <laughs> you, as peers. Thank you for having you, me. You have absolutely surpassed all of us. Now we're here trying to pick your brain and learn from you, which is what I love about this game. 
Jeff, thank you. Um, I want to dive right in, but we do have a tradition here at The Fighting Entrepreneur. If you don't mind raising your right hand and repeating after me. I, Jeff Lerner. I, Jeff Lerner. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. To tell the truth and nothing but the truth. To tell the truth and nothing but the truth. And reveal my $100 million ridiculous ROI secrets. And reveal my $100 million ridiculous ROI secrets. Sweet. All right. Officially on paper. That is a legitimate, can be held in court against you type of uh, uh, oath. <laughs> Jeff, um, I, I got all kinds of questions. I don't know where to start. So I'm going to start with first just saying, um, what the heck? <laughs> like, tell the background story here. You've built a $100 million company. What is that company? And then we'll work backwards to figure out how the heck you started it on a $20,000 budget. But yeah, stage is yours, man. Please talk. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to err on the side of brevity and let you, if you want more, draw out more. You know, I, oh, sometimes, some, sometimes people ask me a question and 30 minutes later, the show's over. And so I'm going to try not to do that to you. But um, I, yeah, I mean, the, the company, so my, my company's called Entra and it's, it's really an ecosystem in the making, you know, as, as you know, cool as it is. And, and I would say we're not, we're certainly not done yet. Um, but it's, it's, it's really a work in progress. I mean, it, I'd say we're at, we're calling it version 1.9 is where we are. Um, we're getting ready to cross into 2.0, but really the idea was to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And let me just say, by the way, kind of pursuant to your intro, I love this industry. I love this world. And I, and I love the, 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 sort of the idea that guys like you and me and, and our audiences represent, which is this new era of business that's so large and abundant and, and, and very open. I think it's very different than traditional business. You know, technically, if somebody was surveying the online business education landscape, you and I would be front and center as direct competitors. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, these are two of a handful of guys that are like going at it. And yet, I don't think you or I look at it that way. It's like, we're, we're allies in a revolution. And on the other side of us is maybe more of like Harvard and Yale or University of Florida, right? Or, and it's like, to me, we represent a whole new generation and an and, and era of learning. And I'm just excited that that's how guys, you know, it's certainly you, that's how you look at it. And, and I, I consider it really a blessing to have you in my life. And I don't, I don't think of this as competitive at all, because if you win, I win. And frankly, if, if you, me and 10 other guys and 10 other companies like ours win, it means there's hundreds or thousands of major universities that don't get to overcharge people anymore for undervaluable education. I was going to say, if, if 10 of us win, the world wins. <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly how I look at it. So, so for me, yeah, I wanted to, to kind of, you know, write my chapter in the book of the reform of mainstream education. And for me, I believe that the most uh, valuable, maybe the most constructive thing I can do to help change the world and I don't say that lightly. I have some deep beliefs around what I think the world needs right now. And I think COVID has intensified uh, and clarified a lot of the dynamics that I think about a lot around individualism, empowerment, control, big government, dependency culture, victim culture, you know, lots of big, big ideas, right? And I think the, the single best thing that I can do for the world is to help create more entrepreneurs. Uh, to me, I've been, I've been fond lately of saying that entrepreneur is the opposite. Of, the word entrepreneur is the opposite of the word victim. And it's just totally about empowerment. It's about commitment to some higher ideals. It's I get that everybody wants to make money, but there's a lot of good jobs out there that pay people pretty well. There, you know, I think it, being an entrepreneur is about a lot more things. And so for me, I wanted to create an ecosystem that could actually facilitate the transformation of people into entrepreneurs. And, and, you know, again, you and I are very aligned in our mission, you know, this concept of the fighting entrepreneur. Entrepreneurialism is, is a warrior code. It's a, you know, it's a way of being in the world that's, that's against the grain. And it takes a lot more than just knowledge and just courses that articulate funnels and tactics and, 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 you know, techniques. It's like, there's a, it's almost like you got to go to like a, it's like, it's like the difference between learning about 
naval warfare and becoming a Navy SEAL. They're just two completely different things. And, and we're trying to create entrepreneurial warriors here. But for that, you need a lot more than courses. And so I looked at the landscape and I said, okay, you've got gurus. And I don't consider you a guru. I consider you a, a graduate, a, whatever the class above that is. But I mean, you've got all these gurus out there, these talking head, Lambo driving, you know, beach sitting in a hammock on their laptop in Phuket or whatever. And they're, they're selling it one way. And then you've got traditional education that can't, can't really teach entrepreneurship because it's like, it'd be like hiring academics to come teach Navy SEAL training. Like you just, they're not entrepreneurs. So you can't learn how to be that from them. You know, they're bureaucrats, right? They're, they're tenured professors that make $90,000 a year and can't be fired. It's the opposite of an entrepreneur. You're not going to learn it in school. You're not going to learn it from gurus. You've got these platforms that are just purely like software, like, oh, I've got the magic software. And if you just plug in lead pages or Kajabi or Kartra or Sam Card or ClickFunnels or DropFunnels or blah, that it's like, you know, somehow going to, you know, to me, those are, that's like saying, oh, if I just go stand at the bar, all the girls are going to hit on me. No, it's like who you are, what vibe are you putting out? It doesn't really matter the tool. And um, just the landscape was inadequate. And so I, Entra is my attempt to, to improve that. I don't know. I keep going, but that's, that's on. No. That makes sense. So how is it a hundred million dollar company? Like, what are you selling? Let's get a little bit more into the weeds and the tactics, I guess, of it. Yeah, totally. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a typical, I say typical, it's a, we're not doing anything particularly different than what's been done out there. We're just doing it really, really well, where we've put together a value ladder and we've graded the value ladder based on, you know, the things that drive people's perceived value, which are about experience, engagement, how, how you know, levels of access, right? Who, how much one-on-one, -on -one, how much white glove support, how, you know, do they get direct access to me as, at the highest level? And, you know, we've just built a good value ladder and we're just executing the hell out of it. We've got uh, a, a funnel that's crushing it. We're in the process of creating three to five, uh, three to five more funnels. We've kind of, I wouldn't say we've hit capacity on one funnel, but I think it's getting more and more expensive to scale one funnel. Um, so we're building more funnels, but basically it's a, it's a pretty linear process. We have, and we have levels for everyone. So we have free books, we have low cost trainings, we have low cost courses, we have some upgraded courses. We have higher price bundles of courses if you want to get really, really deep and study with, you know, experts in the fields on different digital business models. We have a coaching program. We have a mastermind. We just rolled out. We've been waiting for because of COVID, but we just rolled out a, a live event series. And actually, as of tonight, we're going to be in the software business. We just rolled out our own uh, comprehensive software solution called Entresoft that I think is going to make some noise in the industry. Um, but you know, oh, very cool. So you have a funnel that you're able to scale and go deep with because you really refined it in, in that funnel is value ladder driven. So there's an entry level price point. And then as the customer wants more from you, you give them that ability, whether it's more personal, direct communication, more hands-on, more coaching, more support. There is a point in the value ladder. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong at any point here. So now the you you probably are very data driven is my guess because I know you do a lot of media buying so you know average customers that will upgrade to what level you know what your customer is worth at x amount of time so you know what you can spend up front you dial up the paid advertising find winners of ads find winners in pages keep dialing the thing up and keep building the back end and the support infrastructure out so that you can keep upgrading these customers through it and at some point you've started to have this massive ecosystem of customers that you're like, hey, you know what? It's time to provide them with the other additional things they need in order to build their business. So um, whether it be additional courses, more skill sets, or in the case of what you just said, software. So now you'll offer them software because you've got them in one place. They need more things. You might as well recommend them those things and add value to their lives while adding value to your own business. And that'll probably be how you go from a $100 million business to a three or four or $500 million business, in my opinion. Did I kind of summarize that? Was that an adequate summary? Yeah, very well. No, I mean, the, the concept is called vertical integration, right? Find more things that are relevant to your audience that they're going to need anyways. You know, it's kind of like my buddy, Jeff Fenster, who owns a franchise company called Everbowl. 
you know, anybody that buys a brick and mortar restaurant franchise has to hire a contractor to build the franchise, right? So what did he do? He started a construction company so he can help people build their franchises and pass savings onto them, but still keep the margin for himself. It's, it's how every industry scales beyond a certain saturation point. Got it. All right. So we'll come back and talk more about the actual product lines. And, you know, I'm, one of the things I'm curious is, is like, okay, you did 6 million. I'd love to break that down. Just what part of your business did what, but let's talk about the $20,000 budget matter. Uh, and I'm sorry, I got the timeline wrong. It was a year and a half or it was three years or it was the last year and a half was the biggest yeah. velocity. So you started it with a $20,000 budget. It's escalated ridiculously quickly. So you did something super right in the beginning is my guess. So talk to us about that. Yeah. And what I did right is exactly why you're confused on the timeline. Okay. Because technically, I started spending that budget almost three years ago. It was about 20, well, it was September 2018. So whatever that is, it's April right now, May, June, July, August, September. So what's that? 31 months ago, two, two months, two years and seven months ago. Yeah. I started spending that $20,000, but I didn't sell anything for a year. So you could say, oh, well, dollar one of the business was less than two years ago. Mm. But- I started, you know, what I did was, I mean, one of my, you know, whether you, you talk about the law of the farm, which is a Stephen Covey concept, one of my favorite books, and I had no idea how much it would change my life is a book called Newt Ham, or it's called Growth of the Soil by Newt Hampson, K-N-U-T. And uh, it's, it has nothing to do with marketing, by the way. It's, a, it's an allegory. Um, it's by uh, Newt Hampson's like this great Danish writer. He's like the the, the Ernest Hemingway of like Denmark, or maybe it was mm. Norway, but anyways. And it's just about this guy who just like plants an acre and then buys another acre and then plants a second acre and then buys another acre. It's like the most boring book ever, except that at the end of his life, he's got like this massive farm and this huge operation, right? It's like when you just take the time to do things the right way, magic happens. The universe rewards delayed gratification. If I could change any one thing on the internet that would dramatically transform the, the, the statistical outcomes of success online, it would be to switch the mindset from immediate gratification to delayed gratification. In fact, if anything, you should be looking to delay gratification even longer. You should always be, going, okay, because like the seals say, slow is smooth, Smooth, it's fast. Want to go faster, get smoother. Want to get smoother, go slower. If I'd mm -hmm. had more, you know, it's like uh, the great copywriter who was, was it Gary Halbert, I think he said, if I'd had more time, I would have written less. Just the idea is just draw it out, man. Build the foundation the right way. So I started in September, 2018, putting out these videos. And I'm, and this is true of me too, by the way. I, if I actually, there's some background circumstances that forced me to start selling after almost a year. Honestly, if it weren't for that, I would have taken longer to get to dollar one because I just wanted to build the audience. I wanted to build the goodwill and the reciprocity in the market. People say, how'd you scale a product so fast? It's because I spent a year fomenting the demand for that product by giving so much value. You know, it was on, forgive the analogy, it was like foreplay. Mm -hmm. People were just like, please, can we get to the part where you sell me something, please, right? Like I spent a year just putting out videos and, and, and I talk about the $20,000 budget. It was like, I, was, I would put out a video that's like, hey, my name's Jeff Lerner. You probably don't know me. Um, give me 10 seconds before you, you judge me. I'm a dad. I live in Southern Utah. I just sold my agency. I'm basically, I'm 39. I'm retired. Let me tell you for a second about how I did what I did. Like how am I 39 at home playing with my kids? on a Tuesday afternoon. And I would teach them some lesson about marketing or life or why I still get up early in the morning, even though I don't have a boss or, you know, whatever. And, and I would spend, let's say $100, $200 to shove that video in front of a particular cross section of the world, right? I might pick like, okay, this video I'm going to push in front of Gary Vee's audience, or this video I'm going to push in front of, you know, Australian women between 45 and 55, or whatever demographic or interest cross-section I, I might choose. And this was all done with Facebook. Obviously, Facebook lets you do that. And so I put hundreds of free content videos out to the market. I boosted them all into different cold audience segments. 
And then I, and I was constantly doing this, but I was constantly going back and evaluating the data. Okay, who's responding to me? What types of videos are they responding to? What videos are getting the highest engagement? I didn't really look so much at likes. I looked at comments and I looked at shares. Which videos are getting the most re, you know, heavy engagement? And which videos are getting, and the particular metric that I looked at was, how much is it costing me to generate a 10 second view on Facebook? And so you think about from a list building perspective, over the course of about 10 months, I created an audience of 2 million, a little over 2 million people that had watched at least 10 seconds of one of my videos. And I did that at an average cost of about a penny per 10 second view. And by the way, when I started, my videos were getting like five cents per 10 second view. And so by the end of the grand experiment, I had optimized my topics, my subjects, my my headlines, my every, you know, I had figured out what Facebook liked and what the audience responded to. And I was getting more targeted about who I was promoting it to. For example, by the end, I was almost exclusively promoting it to men because I'm a 40 year old dad. That's just who, who stopped to watch. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, anyways, I generated a list of over 2 million people that I could then run ads to retargeting ads for a penny a person. So for 20,000 bucks, I effectively built a list of of 2 million people only if, you know, compare that to an email list where you, yeah, you got 2 million names on your email list, but you know, if you're lucky, you've got 10 or 15% deliverability or, as opposed to on Facebook. If I serve it to 2 million people, Facebook's going to make sure that 2 million people see, at least see the ad, right? So when it came time to build a course, and by the way, your cost to promote something is a lot less if it's to a warmer audience that recognizes you. So that 20,000 bucks really laid the groundwork for me, be, me to be able to launch a course out of the gate and at least get enough critical mass to get proof of concept, you know, develop my MVP, not just the MVP on the product side, but to get sufficient initial scale to where I could prove out the fulfillment systems and have critical mass to, to build some upgrades and additional products. And, you know, you just, it's hard to build a business when you have two customers a week. Mm -hmm. But because I'd conditioned that audience, I could have, let's say, a thousand customers a week, or maybe at least two to 500 customers a week out of the gate at a break even, which, by the way, I would not have broken even. Here's the thing oh, $20,000. But, and you know this, Onik, if I'd come out of the gate selling a course to a cold audience, it would be very unlikely that I could have done it, even at a small scale, at a break even on my front end ad spend, if I was pushing it to just a cold audience. But by taking 20,000 bucks and a year of time and warming up an audience at a fraction of the spend of what Facebook would charge me if I was pushing an actual solicitation, right? Because it's a lot more expensive to promote a product than it is to just boost free content. Yeah. It probably saved me $20,000 in ad spend in the first week I recouped so, that, right? So when you boosted those, were you doing a boost by video views? Was that the objective you were choosing? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Yes. Or re reach. And did you have any link in there? Were you taking them to any page or it was like, nope, just stay on the Facebook I would, ecosystem? I would invite them to just to like my page, my fan page. Oh. on Facebook. I thought if I, so, if, the goal was it. to get as much data as cheap as possible. And if the CTA kept them on the platform, I assumed Facebook would give it to me cheaper, which I believe it did. Oh, of course. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Okay. So during this time, talk to me, what are some of the things you're looking for? You're looking for which you're doing demographical studies to see which demographics are, to, are responding the best to you, which countries, age groups, men, women, are you looking for subject lines or titles that are hitting hard? And what was the purpose? Was the purpose of getting this data so that you know how to title your product that you come out with a year later? Or like, why were you gathering this data? What was your intention? Yeah, I mean, you just you just uh, sort of instinctively landed on most of most of what it was about. Yeah, it was obviously demographic and psychographic, you know, avatar development. But a lot of it was message refinement, figuring out who, wh what version. You know, look, I can talk about a lot of things. I can talk about my deep love of working out at the gym. I can talk about how I like to experiment with different diets. I can talk about how I like to biohack my sleep. I can talk about all the therapy I've done with my wife because I deeply care about relationships. I have a John Gottman book on my desk right now, why marriages succeed or fail. Like I love that. I can obviously talk about digital marketing. I can talk about 
being a dad and adopting kids and learning to parent. And, 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 and by the way, all that is relevant to the entrepreneur conversation because mm-hmm. by virtue of my income and my time flexibility, I, I, could, I could take a year and just do weird body experiments you know, if I wanted to. And like everything, entrepreneurship is at the core of every lifestyle or life interest conversation for me. So it was all relevant and it was all germane and and I could tie it all back to what I really wanted to talk about, which is using a new economy, using new economy business skills as a foundation to create the life that, that anybody wants, whatever, however that looks. And so I was, I was actually out there in the market, not just figuring out like who wants to listen to me, but also what is it that they want to listen to me talk about? What angle on entrepreneurship is going to, is going to get traction and is also going to differentiate me in the market. And I I was fortunate that what I naturally wanted to do is what ended up working out, which is you want to talk about how to make money on the internet, stop talking about how to make money on the internet and start talking about the life that you can build if you figure out how to make money on the internet, right? Speak to the vision, speak to the the, the pain, people's pain is not that they don't have enough money in the bank. Their pain is that they had to miss their kid's little league game or they had to, you know, they're 40 pounds overweight and they can't figure out how to get to the gym or they want to buy, you know, they, they just got a, a high blood pressure or a pre-cancer diagnosis and they went to Whole Foods and said, okay, I'm going to switch to buying organic meat, but it's an extra $2 a pound and I can't afford it. So I think I'm going to die because I can't afford better food. Like that's people's pains. And when you when you start having the conversation in those ways, A, it's a lot more fulfilling. But for me also, you start attracting different people. And I think that's part of what I've done well is I've just, I, you know, I'm attracting people that have been maybe looking at this internet business thing for a long time and nothing's ever passed their smell test because it's all the douchey Lambo bro marketers. And they finally hear a guy talking about, going to therapy with his wife and how he's able to pay for that and have time to do it. Because by the way, most therapists don't work after five. So if you don't get off work till six o'clock, how are you supposed to go fix your marriage? Mm. And like, they're like, yeah, I like this guy. I trust this guy. This, he's going to be the one. I've been looking at this stuff for five years. I hate my job, but I don't trust any of these bro marketers. But this guy seems different. And I wouldn't have known that if it weren't for all this data gathering. And so by the way, when, when it came time to build my course, It was so easy because I already knew everything. Like it would have been a big gamble to launch, to sell an entrepreneurial training course called the Entre Blueprint and have the first 50% of the course never talk about how to make money on the internet or even anything specific to a business. You know, the first 50%, the first three modules of my course, the six module course talk about the three P's of excellence, physical, personal, and professional excellence in that order, by the way. And then The Three Legs of Successful Action, which talks about history and studies Henry Ford and and Sam Walton. And then the Three Phases of Legacy, which architects a framework for, you know, success over time. And it's it's all more like almost like listening to Tony Robbins. I don't want to call it Tony Robbins because that pigeonholes me too. But, I, you know, you you go through four or five hours of training and I've yet to talk about how to place an ad or generate a click or make a dollar. That would have been really dicey for me to come out of the gate with and spend all the time to develop the product unless I already knew that it's actually what people want. And was that, so what you found is when you posted these videos, did you find that, um, let me ask this question the right way. When you posted that video, did you find that that things that were more tactical were getting less views, but things where you would talk about your relationship with your wife and how having money has impacted your relationship with your wife, that those would just take off and get more views? Is that? 100%. The tactical stuff had the highest cost per view, the lowest engagement, and, and generated the lowest quality comments and feedback. It was, it was, that stuff was only interesting to the lowest denominator cross-section of the, the broader audience. The best mm-hmm. videos I had... Uh, And by the way, it was also through this feedback that I realized that it was okay, that it was ultimately going to be safe and in fact desirable to evolve my, my, my position and my mission over time into one that was truly us versus them with mainstream education. 
Hmm. You know, could I come out and say, I'm going up against college? Now, you don't know. You, that could be a total turnoff. That could, that could freak out all the, you know, the quote, legitimate, affluent, successful, professional people in the audience that all went to college. But because I did all this, I knew that actually they love that conversation. They're worried about sending their kids to an overpriced college experience that's not going to result in getting a job. I'm tapping into something. And so, um, you know, that was, that was really important to get that validation that would, that would ultimately govern the arc of, of the whole business. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, this has come up quite a few times um, and we've actually made changes in our courses. So me, one of my strengths and one of my weaknesses is I'm tactical. I love tactical. As a matter of fact, this podcast is tactical. I always make sure all my guests know that before we come on, but you're absolutely right. Um, that was a choice I made because this podcast has a very specific goal and that actually has nothing to do with our listeners. It's all about me. <laughs> I've always said that this podcast was self selfishly started and it's probably the one reason I've nourished it so much is because I learn from it. I implement what I learn from my audience, um, from my guests, sorry. Um, but if you look at some of the podcasts and you look at some of the things out there that take off and seem to skyrocket way more, they are absolutely mindset driven. They're absolutely talking to people and talking to their hearts. We started noticing some of the most successful courses out there, tactical internet marketing, make money courses, spent a lot of time in the beginning just focusing on exactly what you said and we've evolved. So we refilmed the entire, my core course, the one that everyone knows me for, email startup incubator, we refilmed it so that the first two modules are genuinely just straight up. Here's how you take action. Here's how you get results. Here's some rhythms you need. And I actually think that we can evolve even beyond that. And the feedback we get from students about our course in general is I, I, moon, moon light years ahead of where it used to be. Um, now, course changed too, so it's probably a little bit of both. But I want everyone to note that real quick. Like that's just, I wanted to note it for the audience is that that's feedback I've heard from multiple amazing content creators that are actually getting results from their students and scaling is you've got to talk to the heart of your customer. Um, Jeff, you mentioned something, so I want to break away a little bit. First of all, brilliant, brilliant exercise that you did for that first year. Very patient, and I commend you on that. I don't think 95% of people out in the world have that kind of patience. Like They're just not that analytical. People ask me all the time too, how do you scale webinars and how do you scale things to you know, spend 1.3, 1.4 million a month in ads? And I'm like, guys, we, we look at data. And we just study the data and we do what the data says. And it's like the most boring answer for people. They're like, oh, come on, man, give me the secret sauce. And it's like, that's the secret sauce. We look at the data. And I, I believe you when you say, hey, I took a year to just really understand my freaking target market so I can always be speaking to them. A couple of questions and I want to wrap that up. And then I have some questions on the tail end of that. If I were, if I want to stalk you right now, I want to hack what you did. I want to see those videos. Can I go back and still see them? Are they on your page? What's the page? Yeah, go to just go to my Facebook page or my YouTube channel. What which which is your Facebook page? Uh, my handle all over is Jeff Lerner official. Jeff Lerner official, everybody. If you're not writing this down right now or if you're at least not mentally noting it, if you're driving, I want you to start seeing what I'm doing. All right. Pay attention to the questions I'm asking. And I want to ask you if you can tell me what I'm about to do or why I'm asking him these questions. So I just said, hey, I would like to go back and watch those years worth of videos. I want to just go ahead and spend maybe a week and just steal all the data that Jeff got over a year. Here's what you'll notice. Some of them have like a thousand views. A few of them have like 300,000 views. Those are the ones that were getting a lot of traction. For first of all, they were really cheap views. So I put more money behind them, but also they started to spread organically. And you'll notice what those videos were. One of them was called, hey kids, here's how to make school not such a waste of time. And it was a story about how I was taking my daughter and some of the neighbor girls to school. And I asked them, so like, what are you learning? And they literally couldn't tell me. And I'm like, so you sit there all day, every day learning stuff and you don't remember any of it. And they're like, basically like, no. And I'm like, okay, clearly you're not interested. So here's a question you can ask your teachers to just kind of maybe make this all a little more relevant. And I just told that story on the video. Yeah, so that video got something like 300, 400,000 views. And, and most more than that, it was the specific comments and the feedback. It was so many parents saying like, man, 
I want, I wish, th- I wish this had been my dad growing up, or these kids are so lucky that this kid, this dad is explaining this to them. Or, you know, I just, I realized there was a, a main undercurrent in culture of educational dissatisfaction. Mm. And it made viable what I really wanted to do because I didn't really just want to be in the guru, make another course business. Yeah. So uh, a personal question or, or, okay, wait, lesson back for everybody who was listening. I'm going to go back and watch these videos and I'm going to funnel hack Jeff and that's what we do. And then I'm going to message Jeff and ask questions. You want to know what the great are doing. You want to be great, study the great learn from the great. So Jeff has figured stuff out I don't know how to do. And that's going to be inspiration. It's going to be, um, in, yeah, it's super inspiring to me. By the way, I never get jealous. Um, and I've seen a lot of people out there that do, especially bigger marketers, bigger businesses, get to a place where you, if you feel like you're the top dog, you get jealous. I just love learning. That's why I do this podcast. I'm absolutely in love. What's the name of my company for crying out loud, everybody? The name right. of the company is freaking learn. I love learning. And so um, yeah, this is so cool. So the first, you said there's six modules. This is your main course. So I know that you've got like that main, this is like the gateway to entrenation, right? It's like, this is where most of your ad spend goes towards this one course. Forgot the price of it, but what do you teach in that? Like one of the challenges I'm having Jeff right now is that there are about 30 or 40 or 50 or a hundred different business models that can be deployed on the internet. And I really believe that the same one, I don't think should be fit for everybody. I think people are different. So it's like, I would love to have a course that's like a standard course for all learned students to take. And I've been struggling with what that is. But then as you start to say, hey, half of my course is about the way to be an entrepreneur. And I start to wonder, I'm like, I can't help but wonder, I'm like, what's in the rest of that? And maybe you're not even getting into tactics in that first course at all. Maybe you're keeping it just as what does it mean to be an entrepreneur on the internet? Can you talk me through a little bit about that? Like, how have you addressed that? Yeah. So, and you're right. It's a, it's a fine balance to strike where you, you need to give people some specifics to connect so that they can actually visualize, okay, what would it look like to be do to be a digital entrepreneur? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, I I'm very much with you that I do not like, this is one of the reasons the, the guru model drives me nuts is it's like whatever guru you end up subscribing to you, you inadvertently, limit yourself to whatever business model that guru happens to teach, right? Or, yeah. or maybe they have multiple courses and you, you know, but it, there's all, usually the typical guru is that like one. a guy that got a result doing a thing and now he's teaching that thing. Yep. And that result may have been, by the way, five or 10 years ago. It may not even be a thing anymore. Um, so, yeah. so what I did was I took a little bit of like a light survey approach and I said, okay, I'm going to show you the top three business models that I think kind of stand the test of time. I've used them. I know a lot of other people that have used them. They generally encompass a set of skills that would apply to virtually anything else you're going to do online. And at least it gives you a starting point to kind of be drawn towards something, uh, towards a place to start. And, and, And so I kind of position it as like, here are the top three business models that you know, 98% of people are getting results with online. And it's, you know, it's straightforward stuff. It's affiliate marketing, it's digital agency, and it's the knowledge business. And Mm. the way I look at it is essentially it's this, you know, affiliate marketing is about, you know, being as, as lean and efficient as possible, selling other people's products, using other people's platforms, using other people's merchanting, and just essentially focusing on leads and messaging. And then, Agency is essentially about actually building a a service business, right? Where you have some kind of ongoing relationship with not just leads, but clients who you service. And then the knowledge business is actually about learning to essentially brand yourself and become part of the value proposition, if not the entirety of the product. And, Mm. And those three frames generally encompass all the other variations too. Got it. So for your entry level program then is that one of the main goals is hey let's get you a let's get you a high level knowledge of the different business models and let's get you to make a choice so that at the end the one of the biggest outcomes they've had is hey of the three i'm going with number two or i'm going with number three um 
And is that kind of how the ascension value ladder happens where it's like, okay, now that you know which one you're doing, next step, let's go to this, or am I oversimplifying? No, you're actually stating where we want to get to. Um, You know, total transparency is, uh, and it's not like something I wouldn't share. It's just that in a lot of other contexts, they wouldn't care for the level of detail. But Mm -hmm. we are, you know, we're, again, we're a very young company. We've actually, I mean, this, this course we're talking about was created less than two years ago. So, you know, we created the course. We had to make our business work for a period of time just selling that course, right? Mm. I mean, a $39 course is a tough way to build an online education business. So very quickly, we, we kind of scrambled to get other courses in place that were, you know, if we're going to introduce people to three business models, we wanted to be able to have them select either one or say, I want to learn more about all three and go deeper. And, and initially, the way we ended up doing it was we really encouraged people to kind of go for a bundle and say, okay, here's the three different businesses. But although you may know enough now to be dangerous, you don't really know enough to be selective. Mm. So now we're going to connect you with more advanced courses on all three of them if you could actually see yourself becoming a digital entrepreneur. Now, the ultimate goal is to actually have them specialize earlier, more like a college where you kind of pick a major. And I would say this year, 2021, we're, we're in the process of revamping each, each of the deeper dive courses to be where, because, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of it is about supporting the price point you need to in order to make the economics worse work. Yeah. Right now, I wouldn't feel like we could sell a single course as the primary offering at a price point that would really support the whole model. Yeah. But we got to redo the courses and then we will. And that's what we're doing right now. No, it makes perfect sense. But to answer your question, ultimately the goal is to have them select a model to focus on and then they can branch out from there if they choose. I love that. All right. Listen, um, this has been a really powerful episode. We could go on for a long time and we probably will. I'm going to definitely have you back. I love seeing the growth. I think we, you and I, our company's masterminded like uh, maybe two months ago, uh, yeah. not even longer. And I swear when we last spoke two months ago, you were at like 3 million a month it is what I remember. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's early like, in the month, so don't quote me on six, but that's, that's our target for the month. All right, fine. I'll give you a five. I mean, it's still ridiculous growth, dude. You're almost going to have doubled in a couple of months. You guys are really dialing stuff in there. That's great. Can I ask you, uh, so I have a few very direct pointed questions and these are more for me probably than the people listening. Is all or most of your ad spend still going to that front end product or have you gone ahead since we spoke and, and created more front ends? Um, we, we've created the plans to create more front ends, but at, but at present, no, all our ad spend is still going into that main funnel. Although I will say we've branched into, you know, at the time we spoke, it was all Facebook and YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, we've at, well, and we were doing some display network, but we've added more search ads. Um, we've moved into Snapchat. We've moved into Taboola. Okay. So we're, we're all right. broad. So- Adding, adding more sources of traffic. I mean, here's the best part, especially when you're doing so much on Facebook and YouTube, you can add those other networks and just retarget on them and do well, right? Like even like it's, it's so crazy. Okay. Of the 6 million, not, you don't have to be mathematical with me and to the point of like very specific, but I'm just curious, how much of that do you say comes from that $39 front end? How much of it comes from like the second ladder of the second peg of the ladder, third, fourth? I'm just trying to group like the percentages again for myself. And when we talk about front end, you know, we have a $39 course with a couple upsells. So, so that will be the front end. Yeah. uh, It's like more like an 80, $90 AOV roughly. on. Okay. Yep. Um, I would say that roughly accounts for 20% of revenue. Okay. Um, The mid ticket, courses is that's our main sweet spot that's probably 50 or 60 percent of revenue and then the remaining 20 to 30 percent comes on the back end which is you know coaching mastermind now i will say that as we diversify the business model i'm expecting that you know because we're adding software and events this year Mm -hmm. and i would expect that to drop down to probably 10 to 15 front end Still heavy mid ticket, 40%. Uh, and then probably 15, 15, 15 between coaching events and software. And, and obviously over time, software climbs, obviously. 
that's a long game. Yeah. Man, uh, uh, amazing. Um, really amazing. Mid-ticket, what do you consider mid-ticket for you, price points? I think it's different than what we consider mid-ticket at uh, Learn. Probably two to five. Two to five thousand, right. So, you know, anyone who's heard me talk about it, you guys know I consider two to five high ticket, anything above five super ticket. Um, in our business, a mid ticket is usually going to be 500 to a thousand. But every time I ever teach that, I always tell everybody, remember, those numbers are specifically determined by the business, depending on how they do their business, how they do their niches. Now, why is it, just as a random side note, why is it that Jeff's mid ticket is higher than my mid ticket? It's because. I, and I, yeah, I have my, I have my theory. Um, and maybe we have the same. So I'll, I'll go first and you tell me if this is what you're thinking. It's because Jeff, his, his front end, they're buyers, people that he is selling the two to five K to they're buyers. Um, whereas me, um, when I say high ticket thousand, two thousand dollar courses, high tickets, because I'm selling it to people straight on a webinar who are cold coming in, registering and buying. Um, whereas if someone's already given you $39, the same course that sells for a thousand can be sold easily. It probably sells easier at 2000 than it would at a thousand. That's my theory, Jeff, you were going to say something. Yeah, it, it, you're totally right. And there's a couple, a couple nuances to it. And I think this is really, I mean, this is like you said, it's the answers are kind of boring unless you like succeeding and winning. And then they're really exciting <laughs> answers. Um, yeah. Where, you know, for us, yes, it's the fact that it's a buyer, but it, it's also the fact that we invest so much. Like we don't, we don't come close to making money on our, on our front end buyers, even at an 80, $90 cart value, because we literally assign every single one of them to an advisor who works with them for like weeks and, you know, has multiple phone calls with them. And like, we're spending hundreds of dollars to support an 80 or $90 buyer. But the but the 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 relationship that you build when you do that, right? And so it's just how patient are you willing to be? For us, if if you know, we're like, okay, we don't we're willing to wait between 14 and 30 days to even recoup our ad spend. It allows you, you know, it allows you to drive up your lifetime customer values by spending so much more time in the red, just focusing on relationship rather than profit. Mm. Um, and that's why over time our LTVs have gone up because as you scale and you start to have more money in the bank, you don't need to get as aggressive about closing deals faster. You're more interested in playing the long game. Um, so it's, it's the partly that it's a buyer. And secondly, that it's a buyer that we've invested so much in building a relationship with the other thing to know, and Onik, this is, this is going to be huge for you to know. So like, if we look at our buyers that are just our $39 buyers that don't take any upsells, they're probably worth, a fifth to a quarter of what a buyer that takes the upsells is worth. Oh, I believe that. That's I mean, huge. so the difference between a $39 buyer on the front end and like maybe a $150 buyer on the front end could be five times as much lifetime value. And so we, we've really actually leaned into, we even, I don't know, I promised full transparency. So I'll say this, we even, route and, and curate a little different experience for people depending on what their front end transaction value was. That's smart. Because it's worth spending more time with people that spent more money with you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Brilliant. Man, again, uh, it's unfortunate and it's sad that we do need to bring this episode at some point to an end, right? Um, we could go on for the longest time and I almost feel like a product, Jeff, between you and I that could be so fun to create is if we installed cameras in a room and you and I just spent a day in a room helping one another. I bet you there would be so much value that came out of that because we would ask amazing questions. Um, I want to have you back. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, you gave us your handle. People can catch you, find you at Jeff Lerner official. Uh, what URL can someone go to, to be a part of Entre Nation and any other URLs, books, free reports, come on, give people here listening, whatever you yeah. can. Yeah, if we actually put a landing page together for this episode, if somebody goes to millionairesecrets.com forward slash Onik S, the eponymous uh, URL of a good friend of mine named Onyx and Gull, mm -hmm. millionairesecrets.com forward slash Onik S. And there's a, you know, that branches out to a few different places. They can subscribe to my YouTube channel. They can listen to my podcast where Onik, you've actually been a guest. You're one of my earlier guests. I need to have you back on the show. Yeah, um, love to. Turn, turn about is fair play here. And yeah. uh, they can get my ebook. I have a free ebook they can download called The Millionaire Shortcut. You know, there's nothing to buy on the page. So, 
Love it. Everyone. I'm telling you, go go get yourself involved with what Jeff is doing. It's amazing stuff. What a wealth of knowledge. I know I am, I will, and I'm going to continue learning from a millionairesecrets.com forward slash Anik S, A-N-I-K-S, and also find him on social media, Jeff Lerner Official. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. And to all of you listening, go take action, do something with it. And when life pushes you, stand straight, smile, and push it the heck back. Hey, listen, make sure you click subscribe below. If you're on YouTube, make sure if you're on any of the other channels or any of the other tools or ways of listening to this podcast, please subscribe. Please make sure you leave us a review. Tell everyone you can about us. Um, We are growing every week, which I love seeing, uh, but a lot of growth to go for our podcast. Onicpodcast.com to binge listen to other episodes. Learn.com, L-U-R-N.com to be a part of our uh, entrepreneurial community. And of course, millionairesecrets.com forward slash Onyx S to be a part of Entrenation. I recommend both. All right. This is Onyx signing off. Go out there, kick some butt, fight for your dreams. Thank you very much, everyone. Until next time. Thanks for listening to The Fighting Entrepreneur with your host, Onyx Singal. 